Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I have very few slides, so I, I should probably start with some stories of my interactions with Maxim. I first met Maxim uh, at the uh, Gelfand seminar in Moscow. And unfortunately, I believe half of the audience was also present at that seminar. So uh, whatever I will say, you probably know. But the other half probably wasn't present, so I will say it any anyway. So Maxim was, so it was a seminar you know, this typical Gelfand seminar where which starts very late, and then uh, there are maybe two talks scheduled, and uh, one never, never ends, and uh, the second never starts. So and that was a seminar where we were supposed to learn about Vasiliev invariance from Vasiliev and about uh, uh, what is now known as Kantsevich model of uh, topological gravity from Maxim. And uh, somehow both talks started in some order, I don't remember which order. And then uh, Gelfand immediately s interrupted Maxim, saying that, well, the math you're talking about is OK, but you will never become a great mathematician because your voice is not loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, there was a series of interruptions of that sort where every comma and every symbol had to be explained. And then at some point, uh, Gelfand asked, and what are these letters tau i in, on, on, in your formula mean? And Maxim said, well, this is just some apparatus in topological gravity. And apparently, the word gravity has such an effect on mathematicians that that was completely clear to Gelfand. So he didn't ask any, any further questions. <laughs> so uh, then, uh, well, fast forward, uh, I was very privileged and honored to, to work in the same institute with Maxim. And uh, one of the ideas of his, which uh, was a great temptation for me to follow and to try to imitate, was this uh, idea of uh, the construction of the compactification of the modular space of uh, what we physicists call Wolchett instantons in, in, st in string theory. Oh, yes, we still have to write the paper. And uh, so I always wanted to, to find a similar construction in, uh, in, in the case of gauge theory instantons in four dimensions. And of course, one of the difficulties is that in Maxim's construction, gravity plays an important role because he's, uh, he was studying the uh, holomorphic maps of Riemann surfaces together with the moduli of Riemann surfaces. So this is what in physics language means that he has the Sigma model coupled to gravity. And in four-dimensional gauge theory, we normally try to avoid coupling to gravity because that's, this is always the next step. So uh, at some point, we had, uh, uh, we were with Maxim in, in, at the airport after another conference, which was uh, related to Gelfand, was Gelfand's 90th birthday in Boston. And so we had uh, a few hours to kill. And so we had a few beers and, and decided that there is a construction of, <laughs> of a proper compartification of the of uh, gauge instantons in four dimensions. And by tradition, this was never written up. And we <laughs> we're still, we're still <laughs> planning to, to, to work on it. So what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is related to all these topics which I mentioned so far. Uh, but probably it will not be obvious from, from the presentation. So uh, let me now proceed with my uh, goal. Let me remind you what are the Dyson-Schwinger equations. These are the equations on uh, correlation functions in some in quantum field theory, which uh, naively you think about uh, uh, these equations follow from the invariance of the uh, integral under the small deformations of the integration contour. So you make a change of variables, and then as a result, uh, so you ch make a change of variables, declare that the, uh, that the integral doesn't change. And the result, you derive an identity that the correlation function of these operators with the insertion of an operator, which is the variation of the action, can be expressed as a sum of the correlators of the fewer operators. So here you have n plus 1 operator. And here you have n operators. And one of them is hopefully even simpler than the original ones. Uh, 
So whether these equations are useful or not, it depends on, on, on your luck. So if you can choose nice observables, uh, and sometimes you choose a limit of your theory, this limit could be a classical limit, or it could be some more sophisticated, more sophisticated limit, like a planar limit. Then uh, the dyson schwinger equations form a closed system. It could be a closed system of algebraic equations or differential equations, but at least it's a system of equations which then you can try to solve using ordinary mathematics. So for example, in the classical limit when h bar goes to zero, well, the right-hand side naively goes to zero, and so you, s you get the statement that the operator corresponding to the variation of the action is zero, which means that you have uh, reproduced the classical equations of motion, which we view as closed system of equations. So that's the Schwinger equations, and in a sense, a statement that in quantum theory, if you know how to solve classical equations of motion, then you basically know how to solve quantum theory. Of course, this is in practice, it's not it's rarely the case, but it's, uh, it's a principle. Uh, an example of this, uh, how this works, I mean, it's not really a workable example. It's, it's really a dream. Uh, but it's a dream which driven many people to, to consider many interesting things. In gauge theory, where your set of fields is a space of, is a set of, uh, your fields are connections. And the action, the simplest action in the young mills action, which is the L2 norm of the curvature of the connection. Uh, an observable, which you can consider, is not really a local observable, which is inserted at a point, but rather something which is associated to, to a loop. And the representation of the group, the group here is UN. So the observable is just a trace in the representation of the monodromy of the connection along the loop. And one particular observable, which is uh, the uh, normalized expectation value of the uh, Wilson loop in the fundamental representation, in the n-dimensional fundamental representation. So Misha came just at the right moment, because that's, that's uh, the equation which he could understand, uh, or argue that it is wrong. That uh, if you take a limit, so it's more sophisticated than the classical limit, it's a limit when the number n number of colors in physics language goes to infinity, and the coupling constant goes to zero, so that the product, uh, which is called hoofed coupling, is kept finite. In this limit, the dyson schwinger equation uh, becomes a, a version of, it's a nonlinear diffusion equation in the loop space. So it's a, some kind of loop space Laplacian, which is rather tricky to define, but it's a second order well, it looks like a second order, but in fact, it's a first order uh, differential uh, equation, a differential operator in the loop space produces uh, a product of these same, of these observables, uh, which is support on the loops which have self-intersections. So if your loop gamma happens to, uh, to have a self-intersection, then it, the, the, you get the product of loops corresponding to the, par to the parts of this loop. So it's a closed system of so it's a system of closed equations and the dream of uh, gauge string duality in, from the, for the last uh, I think 30 years was to make sense of these equations and try to derive some representation of solutions. Uh, so this uh, another example which really works and because it's actually a finite dimensional system, it's a matrix model. It's not the kind of matrix model which uh, Maxime was talking about at the Found Seminar. And there is actually a story about the relation of his model to that model, which I will skip. Uh, so here, the space of fields is just, just one matrix, n by n matrix, Hermitian matrix, if you like. And the action is uh, it's a trace of a polynomial function, some polynomial of degree p, which doesn't have to be prime. Uh, and the observable is uh, what's called resolvent. So it's a trace of one uh, x is a scalar minus phi phi this matrix, again divided by n. And then uh, in the limit, in the planar limit, when h bar goes to zero and n goes to infinity with the product fixed, the dyson schwinger equations become an algebraic equation. In fact, it's an equation of the hyperelliptic curve. So some physicists know what it is. Uh, where y is the, uh, is the expectation value of that observable, of that resolvent, shifted by the derivative of the 
potential. And G uh, is a degree P minus 2 polynomial, which is to be determined from something which I will skip. So uh, this is the, key, the example where the equations really work. And so the solution is presented in the form of a curve. And then you can, derive, you can study systematic expansion in h-bar uh, around the, this curve. Now, uh, so this was a standard story. Now I want to generalize and go beyond what was discussed. So let me remind you that uh, the path integral in quantum field theory typically involves summation. In the, so in addition to the integral, there's also a summation. It's a summation over topological sectors. And in, for example, in the gauge theory, this would be the summation over the uh, sectors of fixed instant on charge. So this is the ex integral expression for the instant on charge. And so formally, you have an infinite sum of integrals over different spaces, the spaces of connections uh, on a bundle with the, uh, of a particular topology. So uh, I would like to find uh, a non-perturbative version of dyson schrodinger equations, which would involve insertions of variation of the action with respect to not only small deformations of the counter, not uh, only small shifts of the variables, but also large deformations, which would take you from one instanton sector, for example, to another. So this delta A, uh, it's a small variation of a connection almost everywhere in space time, except for, for a small region of a neighborhood of a point where Instanton charge is supported. So this is like adding a point like instanton. It is actually very hard to make this uh, well-defined and precise, but I will present an evidence that this is actually um, uh, work, that it actually works, and so such relations exist. <coughs> so let me just make a historical remark that this consistency between the perturbative expansion and so the, uh, the kind of equations which you get from the perturbative small variations of the field variable and non-perturbative expansion is, uh, was used by uh, Novikov, Schiffman, Weinstein, Zaharov in the exact computations of beta functions and supersymmetric theories. So that's, uh, as a principle, this is not something really new. So uh, this is experimental theoretical physics, so I'm going to find a set of interesting examples. And uh, from that, uh, hopefully, one, can, would, one would extend uh, this idea to more general cases. Uh, but for the moment, I'm just playing with, uh, with these theories which I know best. So these are gauge theories and SIGU models. Um, maybe it's a good point to, to tell you another story about Maxim, so now, now that I mentioned SIGU models. <laughs> so, so. It's a bit redundant because it's, it's, it refers to the story which I already mentioned, but nevertheless. So at this first Gelfand seminar where I met Maxim, after the seminar, Gelfand uh, assigned his um, senior and junior pupils to give a ser series of lectures and seminars to, to students who just came to the seminar because uh, they didn't know anything, and I was among these people. And so there were some seminars on statistical physics, on, uh, I don't know, representation theory, and um, other things, and one seminar was called String Theory, which was uh, given by an algebraist who actually, I think, didn't know about String Theory. But uh, as I will not I will mention his name, but he said something, which was that at the first seminar, he said that, well, did you see, uh, did you uh, hear the talk by Maxim? Did you get this impression that once he approaches a problem, that after, after that, there is no sense of thinking about this problem because the problem is completely solved, and there is nothing you can add to this. So uh, this is why I will not talk about SIGA models today. <laughs> so, so I will talk about supersymmetric gauge theories and SIGA models in the back of my mind, but I will not say about them. And more precisely, I will talk about n equals two supersymmetric four-dimensional gauge theories and a particular class of gauge theories. So let me remind you uh, that uh, Supersymmetric gauge theories with extended supersymmetry n equals 2 have two kinds of uh, 
fields. So they have uh, so-called vector multiplets, which contain gauge fields, and a complex scalar, and two uh, fermions, all in the adjoint representation of the gauge group. And the so-called hypermultiplets. These are matter, matter fields, matter representations, which involve two complex scalars in conjugate representations of the gauge group and two fermions. And the particular class of theories which I will consider will be the theories for which the gauge group is a product of unitary groups and the representation is a sum of, uh, of some number of bifundamental representations. So these are representations which are tensor products of the defining and dimensional representation of one factor and it's conjugate for another factor, maybe the same factor. And some number of fundamental representations. So this is uh, N stands for the defining N dimensional representation of the gauge group factor U and I. And MI bar is a multiplicity space. So you may have some number of copies of, of these fields. So, uh, so this is the same in the more physical language. So you have. And mathematically, these theories are called quiver theories, and they, uh, the data which uh, you need to specify to define such a theory is an oriented graph. And uh, uh, so the vertices of this graph uh, label the gauge group factors, and the arrows uh, label the bifundamental multiplets. And then you have an assignment of, uh, of vector spaces sorry, uh, the color spaces and the flavor spaces to, to the vertices. So if you have a vector space mi assigned to the vertex i, then it means that you have m, uh, dimension of mi fundamental hypermultiplets at this vertex. The theory has parameters which are the complexified gauge couplings. At each uh, vertex i, you have a gauge coupling g squared, g i squared, and there is a theta angle, which is convenient to combine into this complex combination, which is a point in the upper half plane. And uh, uh, sometimes it is convenient to think about the elliptic curve, which is for which tau is the modular parameter. Uh, and sometimes it's convenient to introduce the node, which is the exponential of this complexified coupling. Now, in, in field, quantum field theory, the coupling constants are typically not the parameters, because they usually depend on the scale at which you measure uh, these couplings. But uh, you can impose the condition that uh, these couplings actually make sense at the very high energy in the ultraviolet. And actually, that turns out to be an interesting condition, which uh, in physical terms, it's, a, it's an example of a physical problem for, whose solution has an AD classification. So it turns out that. This condition implies that your graph is either the finite ADE Dinkin graph or an affine ADE Dinkin graph. And so it means that in this quiver theory, somehow hidden is the group, which, which is the ADE simple Lie group or the Katsumudi group, which is by no means present. It's not an explicit symmetry of the theory. It's just you, you, can, you see it from the, you know, in the combinatorics of, of the set of, in the combinatorics of Lagrangian. But we shall see that somehow this symmetry or more and its quantum deformations like the Yangian or quantum affine algebra and something else which I uh, don't know is actually present, present as a symmetry which is uh, visible as a guiding, as a principle organizing the dyson schwinger equations which I'm going to present. Now to complete the discussion of the uh, of uh, gauge theories which I want to discuss. Uh, I should also mention that the parameters of the theory also involve uh, the masses of the, the matter fields. And so there is a choice of the mass for the fundamental hypermultiplets, which, is con which can be organized in a complex matrix. And there, is a ma uh, there are masses of bifundamental hypermultiplets, which are complex numbers associated with the edges of, of the quiver. So in fact, the, these masses can be viewed as the one cochain on the graph. Now, uh, to make this, uh, the equation, which equations, non-perturbative Dyson-Schwinger equations, uh, really a mathematical statement, I need to deform my theories so that 
the, uh, the partition function and uh, the correlation functions of interest would become finite expressions, finite sums, more precisely. So uh, I will subject my theory to two deformations. So one deformation is so-called omega deformation. It's a deformation which shifts the scalar field phi in the Lagrangian by a covariant derivative in the direction of the vector field in space-time, which generates rotations. So you have two independent commuting rotations in four dimensions. And so you take them with parameters epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. So, and these will be the deformation parameters of this omega deformation. The term omega stands for the standard notation for the Lorentz generators, Lorentz parameters, parameters of Lorentz rotation in textbooks, which is usually denoted by omega. So this is why I call this omega. So these parameters epsilon are parameters of dimension of mass. And this deformation uh, breaks translational invariance of the theory down to, rotational in, to the rotations which commute with these rotations. So the idea is that if we, we, we can solve the theory with this deformation, then we can recover the original theory by taking the limit when epsilon goes to 0. But the, the theory with this deformation at least some correlation functions are easier to compute. Uh, another information, which is uh, also interesting and useful, and uh, which effectively is responsible for, what, for why I worked at IHS for a long time, is the non-commutative deformation, where you replace the space-time, the ordinary space-time R4, this is a Euclidean space-time, by a non-commutative space, so it's an algebra, essentially it's a Heisenberg algebra. Uh, very naively, you just say that the coordinates in this new space do not commute, and they, the commutators is a constant, constant matrix theta. Um, so it's an algebraic deformation of, uh, in a sense, uh, of a Lagrangian. Uh, you make the coordinates in space-time, and therefore the fields of your theory operators in some Hilbert space, which is the representation of this algebra. The simplest representation of this algebra is, of course, the space of states of two harmonic oscillators. Again, if you solve the theory with this information, then, then by, carefully, by, by, by the limit theta going to 0, you can recover the original theory. So uh, it, actually, it is actually known that uh, once you make these deformations, the resulting theory can be viewed as some kind of matrix model, where instead of the gauge field, you introduce the operator x hat, so that this curvature, the original curvature, is related in a simple fashion to the commutator of these matrices. And the field phi of x, this scalar field in the adjoint representation, which belongs to the vector multiplet, becomes an operator phi hat, which is, so it's an operator in the Hilbert space, which is more or less the original field phi, where you substitute, instead of the ar arguments x, x hat, the operators, with some ordering prescription. And then you add a certain quadratic expression, which is the generator of rotations in, uh, in the space of oscillators. So, uh, as I said before, the crucial, I mean, the, 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 the success of the Dyson-Schwinger equations and the generalizations depends on, on a good choice of observable. And so the observable which I want to introduce is, uh, well, it will be a function of one variable x. And naively, this is just the characteristic polynomial of the uh, adjoint field phi. So it's the, just determinant x minus phi. So if phi had its eigenvalues a, this will be just a product, just a polynomial. Uh, however, uh, the precise definition is trickier. And so it actually involves the ratio of infinite dimensional determinants. So remember, we passed from the field phi to, the, to an operator phi hat in the Hilbert space. And so this is a determinant in the Hilbert space. Um, so it turns out that the proper definition is the ratio of these determinants. 
And as you can see, this is a function with uh, a priori complicated singularities in the variable x. So it turns out to be a rational function in each instant on sector. Uh, it's a rational function of degree n. So for large x, it behaves as uh, it behaves as this polynomial of degree n, but then it has uh, uh, corrections and negative degrees in x. Now, uh, for the quiver gauge theory, where we have several gauge factors, we will have several such observables. So we just take the same definition for each field phi i, phi i hat. So the main claim is that there exist uh, certain Laurent polynomials or Laurent series for fine quivers uh, in, in these observables y sub j of x shifted by some linear combination of the masses and the epsilon and the omega deformation parameters, which starts as yi, and then corrections which uh, involve various monomials in these variables, in these y's, with coefficients which are the products of the uh, exponentiated gauge couplings and the mass polynomials, such that uh, its expectation value is actually polynomial in the variable x. Sorry for the font. So you see, I mean, what's non-trivial here is that, so y a priori has poles. It has many poles in the in variable x. So it, the, more, the higher instanton charge you go to, the higher would be the number of poles. But this combination of y's is such that these poles will cancel between different instanton sectors. And so that means that you have some relation between the, the path integrals which take place in different, uh, at different instanton charges. And so this is like a disc discrete version, defined difference version of the derivative of the action which is inserted under the uh, relation function. So I will call these variables, these observables, these combinations, uh, xi i, the fundamental QQ characters. Uh, will be clear why I call them that. If you take the limit epsilon 1, epsilon 2 goes to 0, so we go back to the ordinary young mills theory, super young mills theory, then these expressions do become the fundamental characters of the group G sub gamma, which I evaluated on a, a particular group element, G of x, which is constructed out of this y's. So in this limit, all the shifts of the argument disappear. So you take a product of the vertices of the quiver, y uh, corresponding to the vertex raised to the power, which is a co-root of the corresponding AD uh, Kasmudi algebra, fine dimensional or infinite dimensional. And then the, um, the complexified coupling, exponentiated coupling, and the ma matter polynomial to the power negative co-weight. And so because of, and because of these co-weights, which are uh, rational multiples of co-roots, the result actually does not belong, does not quite belong to the simple Lie group, but uh, belongs to its, uh, what's called the conformal extension. So it's a, it's a central extension by uh, C star, and sometimes by C star cross C star. So it's some extension of the group, but you can evaluate this element you can take this element of, the, of this conformal group and substitute into the trace in a fundamental representation corresponding to the i-th uh, fundamental weight. So this is going to be a finite or maybe a c uh, infinite series uh, in, the mon in this monomials in y. And the claim is that uh, in this limit, epsilon 1, epsilon 2 goes to 0, the expectation value uh, of this monomial of this expression is, is a polynomial in X. In fact, in this limit, it's, it becomes really an algebraic equation on, on Ys. So uh, you get um, a map. So you get a map from. So you, so you get a one parametric family of the conjugacy class of conjugacy classes 
in the group uh, CG gamma such that the, uh, the corresponding uh, class functions, conjugacy invariant functions, are polynomial. So you have a rational map, rational curve in the space of conjugacy classes uh, on the group. And so you get a curve uh, which you can leave to, um, to a curve uh, in the maximal torus of the group G, which is, which is a cover of the space of conjugacy classes. And that uh, gives you what is known as a zabrick witten curve. So that's one use of this, uh, of this Dyson with Schwinger equations. Uh, if you take the limit when only one of these epsilon parameters goes to zero, then these uh, expressions uh, psi i become the fundamental Q characters of the Yangian of the uh, Lie algebra G sub gamma, which were constructed by Knight. And if you do a slight uh, generalization of, of the story which I presented, uh, you take the five dimensional theory, compactify it on a circle, then these expressions become the Q characters of the quantum of fine algebra, which were introduced algebraically by Frankel and Rishitikin. And again, the claim is that you now get a, a one parametric family of the conjugacy classes, suitably, which you suitably define conjugacy classes in the Yangian or in quantum of fine algebra, such that the fundamental characters, uh, fundamental Q characters are uh, polynomials in X. So you have a rational map. Now, uh, to discuss the case of general epsilons, which is kind of interesting, uh, because it's sort of the double quantum deformation of the classical uh, theory of characters and conjugacy classes. Uh, and also to write, to explain how I write the general expression for this um, QQ character, I need to use uh, Nakajima's quiver varieties, which are associated with the same quiver gamma, and, uh, and two dimension vectors, W and V. So this variety is uh, it's actually a happy color quotient, which uh, here I will write as a uh, holomorphic symplectic reduction with a quotient taken in the GIT sense, or a vector space. So it's a vector space which is again constructed using the quiver data. You have the space of homes uh, between the vector spaces assigned to, to the ends of each edge from the source to the target and the homes from the vector space assigned to, from between two types of vector space assigned to vertices, Vs and Ws, you take its cotangent bundle, so that's, that's a holomorphic symplectic manifold, and the group uh, GLVI, which naturally acts in these spaces, preserves the holomorphic symplectic form, so you can make the holomorphic symplectic reduction. There, is some, there are some stability parameters, uh, which I will skip, and uh, the result is the uh, quiver variety. Physically, this quiver variety is a Higgs branch of, uh, for example, three-dimensional n equals four gauge theory with a gauge group, which is a product of groups U, V, I, and uh, with W, I fundamental hypermultiplets for each um, uh, U, V, I uh, factor in the gauge group, and some by, and by fundamentals. Again, determined by the edges of the graph. And here is the formula. So the general formula is that you take the uh, integral over the quiver variety of certain characteristic classes. So one of these classes is very simple. It's the, it's a covariant Euler class of the tangent bundle. I'm afraid I switched into, into change the uh, W and V parameters. Uh, so that's a, that's a simple class. And the, another class is uh, trickier. This is where the y variables, y observables of the gauge theory will, be, will enter. So they, you take the ratio of these y observables shifted by the uh, churn roots of certain uh, complexes of this queer variety. So these are so-called tautological complexes. If uh, somebody asks me a question later, I will explain what they are. Um, 
So it's a finite, uh, for a finite quiver, uh, sum over the uh, dimensions of the V spaces. So these, these are uh, summed over, and Ws are fixed. So this is, they enter the, the parameters of this generalized character, QQ character. And in the affine case, the sum is a priori infinite, but it's, uh, it's a, so the dimensions belong to a cone. So it's a sum where at each, if you uh, degree in each variable QI, you have a finite number of terms. So it's a, say again? K plus minus. K plus and minus. Kappa. So, kappa. So, so, so there are this, uh, so, okay, so, uh, over this space, there is a complex of, uh, of shifts. So I take its equivariant churn, churn character. You get uh, some number of, uh, well, locally, you can represent this complex by, by two-term complex. And so you, it's a, like, it's a, think of it as a difference of two bundles. And so these, the, these bundles uh, have some rank, which I don't know what it, it could, could vary. So k, k, kappa plus labels the chain roots of this of the of the term in degree one and k kappa minus labels the chain roots in the, in the term of degree zero. Um, I feel like I think I have time. So uh, if you have a vertex i in this in the quiver, you have some number of edges which uh, well, this, this, this is actually unrealistic. Well, it could be realistic for the affine G4 case. So you have some edges which enter and some edges which, which uh, exit the vertex. So you have a complex Well, you use the, the maps. Um, You have a, in the definition of the quiver variety. So we have the space of homes between the vector spaces. So let's be, I, be E be the, the particular operator. And then because it's like a, the cotangent bundle, there is an operator acting in the, in the opposite direction. So, uh, so you can compose. Uh, okay, so, so this is my complex CI. So you use, uh, I mean, you use whatever whatever you you, you have in your at your disposal. You have maps uh, B. E from uh, which, uh, so B, if E is the edge which, uh, whose source is I, so it's, uh, it's this, this is e, this edge, you can apply B E to the vector space V I, and it will uh, take you to the space uh, which is the target, which is at the target of the, of the edge. And so that's one of the, uh, linear maps, which enter the definition, and the same for the for other arrows, and the uh, the point is that the the moment map equation is such that the composition of these maps is zero. So you have a complex canonically associated to each vertex. It, so it is this complex. Uh, the, so the, the churn roots of this complex that, uh, sorry, the covariant churn roots of this complex that we use here. So it's a general formula, but it's too abstract and scary. So let me give you examples where it becomes something very simple. So let's consider, uh, to be specific, the theories with a single gauge group factor. So UN 
uh, gauge theories. And there are two cases. The, the A1 case, where the quiver is just, uh, just the point. And there is another case, A0 hat, where the quiver is a point with a, with a single edge, with a single loop. So in the A1 case, this fundamental QQ character is very simple. It's a sum of two terms. In one, you shift the uh, y observable by epsilon 1, epsilon 2, plus epsilon 2. And another, you invert it. Uh, so this was. Uh, so this is the form of the fundamental QQ character. In the A1 case, there is only one fundamental character because, it's, because it was, there's only one uh, vertex. But uh, the general formula involves also the choice of, um, uh, there is a choice of a vector space W and some parameters, the, which are the equivalent churn roots of this vector space. So these are, W complex numbers, nu1, nu w. And so the general formula is a little bit uh, more complicated, and I think it didn't fit my, oh no, it is, yes. So it involves uh, products, so it's a sum over all partitions of the set one through w into two disjoint sets. And so it involves uh, the ingredients like in this formula, y shifted and y inverse, which is not shifted, but there is a prefactor which uses uh, independently epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. So this is where the uh, QQ character differs from the Q character. So this is why it's a really deformation. And the claim is that the expectation values of all such observables in, the, in N equals to theory are polynomials in X. So it's an infinite set of non-trivial equations. And the second example is this uh, A0 hat theory, which is known also as n equals to two star theory. It's a theory with massive adjoint hypermultiplet. It has one parameter, which I call mu, the mass of the adjoint hypermultiplet. It's what I uh, used to be called m sub e, the mass associated with the edge. So uh, even though physically it looks like, it seems that uh, the conform asymptotically conformal theory, which is the theory with fundamental hypermultiplets and the theory with adjoint hypermultiplet, should not be very different, the expression for the uh, QQ characters is drastically, are drastically different. And the reason is that this theory has this hidden, as a hidden symmetry, it's a Youngian of SO2, and here it's a Youngian of the Katsmudi, U1 Katsmudi. So here's the formula. It involves it's a sum over all partitions, all Young diagrams. Uh, so if, if not for these complicated factors, this sum would, be, would give you the dedicated function, which you saw in the previous uh, lecture, except it was raised to the power 24. So here it's a, um, it's a kind of a dressed version of that formula, which incidentally, if you specify parameters, can, can, can produce a uh, Dedekin function raised to interesting complex powers. Anyway, uh, so here it's a sum over all partitions, and then you have the product over the boxes in the, on the boundary of partition, on the boundary of Young diagram of the partition. Young diagram of my partition, then uh, I use color chalk. This is how far we went from the from the times described by the mill. So, so this is uh, so these are the boxes, uh, the squares in the. So this is partition lambda. This is what I call uh, delta plus of lambda. So these are the squares which can be added to the uh, partition, and these are the squares which can be removed from the partition, from the Young diagram, so I call them delta minus of lambda. And so you have the product where the terms uh, with the red boxes, well, with the 
positive boxes are in numerator, and the, the ones which can be removed are in denominator. Uh, and there is some prefactor, rational prefactor. And so these are the, all the shifts are defined in terms of the uh, arms, legs, hooks, and contents of the boxes. Um, now, uh, so the applications, so, okay, so uh, again, the, the, the main claim is that the expectation value of this observable, and there are also the versions with Ws, which I will not write because it will take too much time. Um, Incidentally, the quiver variety, the Nakajima quiver variety, which I had to integrate over to, to get this formula, here it's a Hilbert scheme of points on C2. So, uh, so it's a Hilbert scheme of points, but it serves to write expressions for gauge theories of any rank. And uh, for physicists, maybe I should say something. Uh, if uh, so, this is the picture of R four where the where the my gauge theory lives. And so there are in particular uh, there is a rotational symmetry with parameters epsilon one and epsilon two. Now the Hilbert scheme of points is uh, it's a, also kind of instant on moduli space, uh, but uh, if you see carefully, look carefully at the uh, weights of the uh, rotational symmetries acting on C2 in which this, this Hilbert scheme of points lives, they actually live in a transversal space. And so here the weights are mu and minus mu minus epsilon one minus epsilon two. So uh, if you like, so if you think, uh, so this is a remark for physicists. The, if you think about a string realization of the gauge theory, and the gauge theory lives on on the, on the stack of let's say d uh, three brains, then there is an auxiliary gauge theory which will produce this uh, queer variety, which lives in the transfer space. So uh, what are the applications of these equations? Well, you can derive, actually, and rigorously prove uh, some of the statements of the BPS-CFT correspondence, which is a principle, which is not a statement, it's a principle, that the correlation functions of current observables in four-dimensional supersymmetric theories are holomorphic blocks and form factors of some conformal field theories and the massive uh, integral deformations in two dimensions. So it's a trivial correspondence between field theories uh, in different dimensions of space-time. So uh, as an example, one can prove, for example, that uh, the instanton partition functions of the quiver theories of A-type, so these are the theories for which the quiver diagram is it's just that. Or an angon uh, for special choices of masses uh, obey the equations of Belavin, Polikov, and Zamolodchikov for the decouplings of null vectors in uh, representations of Virasora, uh, which is uh, the prediction of Aldai, Gayota, and Tachikawa. And so this is the mathematical proof of that. Uh, you can also show that uh, the partition functions, the instant partition functions in the presence of surface defects, where uh, it turns out that this y observables, which I defined, uh, fractionalize. So the, you, out of one observable, you get, you get to define several. And so it turns out that this uh, Partition functions obey the Kinderich of type equations. And so again, this is just a mathematical proof. Um, so um, as a conclusion and speculation, I will just ask a few questions. So we know that the uh, 
this AD symmetry, even though it is not possible, at least not in any simple way, uh, possible to see in uh, uh, gauge theory as in quantum field theory, nevertheless, it is visible in, uh, in string realization of the theory because that's an enhanced uh, gauge symmetry in type 2A description and tensor symmetry in type 2B description. So the question is, uh, what is the meaning of the Yangian deformation of this of the symmetry G gamma in string theory? Is there any role which could, could be play, it could play? Um, and others, again, so the gravity now comes back. So it, so far, I, I discussed the theories on, on rigid space-time, but uh, it is tempting to speculate that there must be also dyson schwinger equations which involve changing the topology of space-time. And so uh, maybe one could derive a nonlinear version of Miller-DeWitt equation on the wave function of the universe, which would be uh, much more useful than the linear equation, which cannot, doesn't fix much. And maybe it could be used as a, as a symmetry principle of the landscape of uh, string vacuum. And mathematical, there are many mathematical questions, uh, even at the level of the uh, equations which I described so far. One is to find a, a version of these equations in the context of topological strings. So there is an overlap of the problems which I described in the language of uh, gauge theory, and the problems which can be defined uh, in the context of uh, topological strings, let's say of A-type or, or non-compact Calabi-Yaus. So there must be a version of these QQ characters which would uh, serve all uh, Calabi-Yaus, all toric Calabi-Yaus. Um, another question is to derelate uh, the QQ characters, which have two parameters on equal footing, epsilon 1, epsilon 2 in the Youngian case, and the exponents in the quantum affine case, to the uh, QT characters, T deformations of Q characters, Styled by Nakajima and Frankel and Hernandez. So conjecturally, these are the same things, but so far, I, I, the definitions which I saw looked very much different. And uh, the last is uh, is my acknowledgement of my thanks to all my collaborators who helped me learn these things over the many years of of, of research. Thank you. Questions? Is it possible to say that mathematical investigating point like instant or terms of Maybe, but I'm not sure. So, uh, so one thing which I should say, which I know, is that. Uh, which I probably should uh, explain better, is that uh, in, defini in defining these correlation functions, so these correlation functions are integrals over uh, other kinds of of queer varieties. not Nakajima. So uh, the adding of point like instant on which I was talking about is an operation on these varieties. But the, the statement that there is a particular combination of, of y observables which I insert here, which is an integral of a Nakajima variety, and it's, it's a combined thing which has this nice properties of being a, rational, uh, being a polynomial function, means that there is a, it's an extension of Nakajima correspondences which he constructs on these spaces to, uh, to the product spaces. So, so in, uh, maybe in the language of this picture, so you see uh, Nakajima varieties are uh, more or less moduli spaces of framed instantons, torsion-free shifts, and some kind of version of, uh, on, on, on this space. And uh, the quiver instanton varieties which I called the other instant, other query varieties live on this space. So from the algebraic geometric point of view, what you study, you study shifts 
um, well, this is in, in the fine case. Um, you study shifts on on the uh, on the four, four complex dimensional. So this is a four dimensional uh, variety complex, which is a product of C two, or you can compactify it to CP two, and the orbifold, where gamma is a subgroup of uh, discrete subgroup of SO two, and so you study shifts which are supported on, uh, on this cross. So they support it here and there. And so uh, even though it's a singular variety, somehow there, it seems that there is a, in, there is a good, uh, so the, what do I say? I'm trying to say. Apparently, there is a virtual fundamental cycle in the moduli space of, of uh, of such shifts. And so this computation, which involves the product, so this product uh, of the Kajima varieties, which, which come from this uh, axis, and instant on, which, are, which depend on NM and other numbers, which I didn't specify in this talk. So this. Uh, Disjoint union of products of moduli spaces, it's roughly the boundary. It's a boundary of the moduli space of, of shifts on this cross. So it is on this space that one needs to develop the, the version of Hecke correspondences and, and so on. And I don't know what's the version, of, uh, what's the picture for the case of finite quivers. So this is for a fine quivers, and it must be something for finite, which should be simpler, but I don't know what it is. Okay. Yes. I have a very trivial question. So this PT character, the Frank Paul Fernandez and others, are this the characters of double up and Hecke algebra or something else? I think they defined as uh, uh, using the representation theory of quantum deformation of W algebras. So there is no obvious relation. The Q and T are completely different parameters. For them, they are completely different parameters, yes. So, so that's why it's a bit untrivial to establish the correspondence, because for, for me, there are two parameters on equal footing. And of course, there is Daha somewhere here, but I don't know. But so this Q and T are different uh, parameters of Daha. So that also has two parameters. But, but we know that the, there are two parameters which are on equal footing. 